Hello everybody, uh, uh, I am Abhishek Sharma. Uh, I am a full stack software engineer by heart uh, who works as a solution consultant at Infochips. Uh, I mostly uh, work on providing cloud-based solutions and I have also worked on uh, IoT-based platforms and also uh, the DevOps part of it. Uh, in my previous organization, I have also uh, build a backend as a service platform, uh, uh, totally in uh, Python, Django, Django REST framework. So uh, the topic for today is uh, I'll be presenting my views on microservices and containerization. Uh, I know there, are, there has been a lot of talks on microservices, so I have changed my slides a uh, uh, slides little bit uh, so that uh, we all get to know microservices better. Uh, I'll be covering few areas from the, uh, uh, cult uh, covering the cultural side uh, of how uh, organization adapts microservices and things like that. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, so let's uh, define what is microservices. Uh, microservices is an uh, architectural style, I would say, uh, 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 to you know build a uh, uh, application as a suite of small services uh, uh, which uh, uh, communicates with each other uh, with a, a lightweight protocol. Uh, they run uh, on its own process they, uh, and each service communicates with each other uh, uh, through IPC mechanism. Uh, there are, uh, you can use any uh, 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 AP, um, I mean, communication protocol like HTTP, RPC over MQP or uh, uh, WebSocket and things like that to communicate uh, uh, between two processes or two services. Uh, so uh, when I first explored, uh, uh, when I first read uh, what the microservices is, uh, I was a little bit confused uh, about like how it is different from uh, service oriented architecture and I had the same expression. So, uh, so defining, uh, 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 differentiating between the two, uh, I realized that uh, microservices architecture uh, is a specialization of service uh, oriented architecture. So microservices takes all good parts of uh, service oriented architecture uh, and is implemented uh, in a different way. So you can see a slight microservices circle coming out slightly. So there is a sort of uh, difference in approach in implementing uh, microservices. Uh, so as the term micro suggests, uh, it is significantly smaller uh, as compared to service oriented architecture where services are built uh, uh, at a very large scale. So if you compare uh, two services from like SOA and uh, microservices, so my, uh, in microservices, services are significantly smaller. Uh, they use lightweight protocols to communicate with each other. So in service oriented architecture, uh, I think you guys must have seen that there is some kind of a middleware uh, we use uh, to communicate between the services. So if that middleware goes down, uh, your entire application goes down. So uh, that is not the case in case of microservices. Microservices uh, 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 communicates, uh, um, in microservices, services communicates with each other uh, uh, um, by defining their own protocols and they, on the contract they agreed upon. Uh, so uh, with that definition of microservices, I have listed down the characteristics uh, uh, of uh, what microservices should uh, have. So if we look at it one by one, uh, so it has to be minimal. Uh, so microservices, so each microservices should adapt uh, uh, single responsibility, uh, single function responsibility pattern. So uh, let's say if you are uh, writing an e-commerce website uh, and if there is a payment service, so that service should only be dealing with uh, uh, the payment part, uh, other services should uh, it's okay for other services to not know the underlying implementation, how payment is processed and things like that. So uh, if uh, one service is able to communicate with other services and it is able to uh, uh, get the response, uh, it's okay. Uh, the second part is independently deployable. So as we are talking about distributed systems over here, so uh, 
uh, each individual services has to be independently deployable uh, on our cloud instances. So uh, uh, not only that, I mean, uh, uh, so your even the deployment strategy has to be independent from each other when we uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, service to service. So uh, uh, let's say if you are uh, writing a, a web socket ser uh, server, then uh, maybe you have to uh, uh, choose the best, you can choose best deployment strategy for that particular service and uh, maybe a simple uh, authentication or authorization service, then you can maybe go ahead and uh, choose the deployment strategy for that. So uh, deployment strategy can differ from uh, one service to another. The third part is configurable. So uh, yes, of course, it has to be configurable because microservices are autonomous. So uh, it should be able, uh, it should be able to self-govern itself and uh, you have to use uh, environment variables, file system mounts, or maybe some sort of a service discovery or like key value pair store uh, so that you can read the parameters dynamically and your service acts accordingly. Uh, the fourth part is replaceable portion. So uh, uh, whenever we write a service, we sometimes face problems like this service is not uh, you know, acting properly in terms of uh, fulfilling the non-functional requirements. So uh, we think of writing that service uh, uh, again, maybe in uh, using some different or better architecture. So uh, your service should be uh, kind of a plug and play nature. So uh, if, if at all you are deploying a new version of your service, uh, it should be completely replaceable and your system should work uh, smooth. Uh, the fifth part is uh, it should be organized around business capabilities. So I think we have already covered this because each uh, functional areas of your business, you should, uh, your services should focus on the uh, implementing uh, those business capabilities. Uh, the next part is smart endpoints. So as microservices gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of choosing our own protocols, uh, how uh, one service communicates to another. So uh, it's good that we choose uh, the best uh, protocol and we define best endpoints so that service can communicate to each other in very effectively. So it's not like if it should always use uh, uh, HTTP uh, uh, and um, it should always use like TCP or a thing like that. Uh, choose your protocol wisely uh, so that you get the best performance. Uh, the next part is elasticity. Uh, elasticity in terms of scaling so let's say if you are facing uh, uh, a lot of if you are getting a lot of traffic uh, onto your server so uh, your services and your infrastructure should be able to scale up and down based on uh, the necessity uh, the next point is uh, resilience so uh, i think uh, microservices uh, needs to be uh, resilient in terms of like uh, if there is a downtime for a particular service. It should not affect the other functionalities uh, of uh, your application. Uh, the next part is, of course, versioning as we'll be developing our uh, services in a very iterative way. So uh, you should, uh, one should keep uh, uh, their, uh, you know, deployment strategies and uh, development cycle uh, according to the versioning. So it should be able to uh, uh, adapt uh, the, this uh, point. So infrastructure automation, uh, yes. Uh, so my, as microservices will be dealing with, uh, as we are uh, uh, dealing with distributed system uh, and it has to be uh, monitored always. So whenever there is a, a high uh, traffic, so it should be able to scale up and down. So your infrastructure, uh, you have to decide your infrastructure in such a way that it should uh, allow uh, automatically scaling up and down based on the uh, traffic that you are facing. Centralized logging and monitoring, I've seen people taking this part as an afterthought. Uh, they generally don't care uh, about uh, this portion, centralized logging and monitoring, and they end up facing a lot of issues uh, when they see downtime of a particular service because they'll not be able to uh, uh, figure out what's, uh, what's uh, happening wrong. Uh, so you should have a centralized dashboard kind of a thing or uh, something uh, where you can look all the your uh, logs and uh, monitorings and uh, on and the monitoring stuffs and things like that uh, the next part is encapsulation uh, your uh, service should cover all the uh, 
should have all the components that are required to run that service uh, effectively. So it should not be, uh, it's like uh, if let's say one service requires uh, RDBMS, so uh, it should have all the components uh, near, uh, near to the service so that uh, they can uh, uh, talk to each other very effectively. And of course it has to be stateless. Uh, so uh, let's quickly uh, go through what are the advantages of microservices over monolithic uh, architecture. So the first point is microservices relies on each other public API. So I've seen a uh, couple of times that uh, in service oriented architecture, most of the developers directly communicate with uh, the database of other service and things like that. So that should not be the case uh, in terms of microservices as uh, uh, we are going to independent, uh, we are going to deploy our services independently. So it has to communicate with the wrapper uh, or the APIs that you built uh, around it. Uh, the second part is decentralization and no single point of failure. So we have already discussed that uh, in service oriented architecture, there is a uh, concept of uh, middleware which uh, always which always runs in between so that uh, service can talk to each other effectively. So if that middleware goes down, so that becomes a single point of failure in terms of uh, service oriented architecture. So uh, in microservices, it is not the case. It is everything is decentralized and each service talk to each other uh, with the best effective way. Uh, the third point is right tool for the right job. Uh, so we get a, with microservices, we get a uh, freedom of choosing uh, the technology stack, uh, uh, technology, or I would say a language, uh, uh, the best language you can write your services in. So we can write uh, one services in Python or Another, another in Node.js and things like that. So you, you get the freedom and you get the flexibility of choosing right tool uh, for the right job. Uh, the next thing is polyglot persistence. Uh, so uh, this is kind of like if let's say one microservices requires RDBMS, you can go ahead uh, and use any SQL database. And let's say if another service is dealing with, uh, let's say for an example, time series data. So maybe you can then think of uh, choosing the database accordingly and maybe you can go uh, ahead with no SQL database and uh, database of that sort. Uh, single responsibility, as we already discussed, uh, it should be focused more on uh, one aspect of uh, the business uh, requirement. I mean, one, com one aspect of it. Uh, the scalability part, uh, yes, so, uh, uh, each service uh, should be developed in a way so uh, so that we can scale it up uh, very smoothly. So even if, uh, let's say, we are upgrading it, so we should be able to upgrade those services smoothly and things like that. Uh, the next one is decoupled. Uh, so microservices should, I mean, the components in the microservices should be loosely coupled and highly cohesive. Uh, so uh, you should develop your microservices in a way so that you know uh, you can decouple all the components that are there in uh, the services and let them talk to each other based on the requirement. Uh, the next part is bounded context. It's okay for like it's okay for one services to not know the underlying implementation of the other. So uh, so that is what uh, bounded context means. So the next point is more towards cultural side like end to end ownership. So with the normal software development lifecycle, we have seen that projects start uh, from requirement analysis and then it moves toward design and then development. And sooner or later, it goes to support and maintenance. So uh, that is not the uh, case. There is a slight difference here. Uh, one team owns the entire service development lifecycle over here and they completely own it. Uh, and independent governance as well so, so that they can uh, uh, because micro in microservice services has to be autonomous, so uh, it should have all the components that uh, can help us uh, track the uh, monitoring metrics and things like that. So let's move on to uh, how can you write microservices in Python. So when I heard about it, uh, uh, I just googled it out. Uh, uh, saying like this, uh, what is the best framework to write microservices in Python? So the first link that I get is about Nameco, uh, which says that uh, it is a Python framework for building microservices. So we'll not go into the documentation of it. I have listed down uh, some of the uh, features that, uh, uh, that it supports. Uh, 
you can install the echo with simple pip install the echo uh, the supported protocols that through which one service can communicate with each other so it support these many uh, you can go ahead and use simple http and get and post uh, you can do communication over rpc uh, mqp you can do pub sub web sockets and it also provide web socket support so there are other features as well uh, uh, so it has a support for unit testing and i guess integration testing as well so this is a very feature rich framework as far uh, as far as microservices is concerned so i think uh, this is good but uh, uh, as we all know that microservices uh, it has to be uh, uh, relatively small we have already seen the minimal point of it so uh, it's not a constraint that you have to use you have to always use this framework uh, so if let's say your service is uh, on only requires http endpoints and things like that you can go ahead and use flask so that is the kind of freedom that we get uh, when we build uh, microservices so you can use flask uh, and let's say if you are uh, dealing with async io you can maybe go ahead and use django channels or uh, scenic i guess there was a talk about it uh, in micros uh, in the europython so you can choose your frameworks based on uh, your requirement so let's see how our services packaged and deployed so deployment plays a crucial part uh, when microservices when we talk about microservices so these are the uh, options that i have listed uh, this first one is traditional like uh, uh, how we used to do in the monolithic we used to uh, create a script that will uh, uh, SSH to uh, our remote machine and it will check out all our code and then uh, it will uh, try to execute our script but uh, this that becomes really difficult when uh, we talk about uh, 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 discrete environment because uh, uh, microservices has to uh, run in discrete environment so we are left with other two options like virtualization and containerization virtualization uh, you can go ahead and use virtualization but it becomes uh, quite bulky because it holds uh, the entire OS. So there will be a ghost guest OS uh, running in the uh, uh, your VM boxes. So it becomes quite bulky. So the next thing is containerization, uh, which is uh, which uses Linux kernel capabilities. Uh, uh, it, Docker container has this lib container execution environment, which directly talks with Linux kernel components. So you can uh, go ahead and use uh, so that the image size become uh, uh, very very small and uh, and comparatively, uh, it uh, becomes much lightweight uh, than hypervisor or VM and things like that. Uh, so, uh, so I'll put this question for you guys: like, uh, if Docker provides the isolation, so do you really need virtual env? So, I mean, uh, we all know that what virtual env is for. It provides good sort of isolation when we talk uh, about Python libraries and things like that. But here we are dealing with Docker, so which provides uh, separate root uh, fs so it's okay uh, if you don't use uh, virtual env uh, it's not mandatory but i guess it's there's no additional text involved as well so uh, you can go ahead and use virtual env so it's up to you guys uh, uh, whether you want to use it or not uh, let's move on to how to containerize python based services with docker so there are four steps so uh, this is a simple flask app which uh, so on the root it will re just return the string dockerizing flask app and it will start uh, our server on all the ip addresses on our local instances so these are the four steps i have listed down the uh, all the uh, scripts uh, over here so you have to just create your docker file you have to uh, uh, say all the commands over there and uh, once that is done you can build your docker image with docker build command and then you can run the docker container using docker run and with the help of docker ps a you will be able to see all the uh, uh, docker container that are uh, uh, running or not running uh, on a particular machine so let's talk a little bit about uh, how can we deal with uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment architecture uh, approach in microservices and containerization so this is with respect to jenkins but uh, i guess you can uh, also use uh, uh, GitLab CI runners and Circle CI uh, to automate this, but this covers the Jenkins part of it. So let's say when our developer pushes uh, any change to the Git repository with the help of webhook, uh, Jenkins triggers a build. So Jenkins uses Docker to build an image based on Docker file. So once the your container is up and running, you can maybe run all the test cases. Uh, and if let's say if test 
if all the test cases are passed, uh, then maybe you can push your uh, Docker image to the Docker registry and uh, you can inform all the uh, instances uh, that are uh, uh, running that image uh, to pull the latest version of it. So uh, the next slide is about like when to use microservices. So uh, I would say uh, don't go uh, 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 with the flow like uh, every big B, big companies are using microservices. So just don't uh, uh, choose your uh, architecture uh, just by the latest uh, arch uh, architecture style pattern and technology. Uh, so uh, uh, I would say if decentralization is identified and very inception of your project. So maybe you can think of uh, writing microservices and uh, maybe if like you are doing a very uh, CPU intensive operation, like if you are maybe doing image processing and uh, video encoding or decoding and machine learning and maybe artificial intelligence. So uh, in that case, it might be helpful uh, because uh, you might and uh, really need to scale uh, those portions, uh, the heavy intensive uh, operation portion uh, in future when, whenever you face a lot of traffic. So I think that is the area I can maybe uh, think of uh, uh, when uh, you can choose to go with uh, uh, right, uh, uh, choosing your uh, architecture as a microservices architecture. Uh, so I have, uh, talk with most of the developers who are using uh, microservices. Uh, they, these are the common mistakes they do uh, when they use microservices. They, like in SOA, we generally uh, talk with the database directly. So they use a shared database. Uh, instead of talking through public API, they go ahead and uh, 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 directly uh, uh, do the queries to the database. So. Uh, this is the one mistake that I have seen uh, uh, that people generally do. Uh, the second thing is they consider HTTP is the uh, only protocol to communicate between services. Well, that is not the fact. Uh, though uh, writing HTTP services is simpler and it's easy to get uh, HTTP services up and running, uh, but that doesn't mean that you should only, only go ahead with uh, HTTP. Uh, maybe a uh, few services uh, are meant to be together, so you don't need to uh, do a round trip uh, and do a HTTP call. You can just go ahead and uh, directly uh, uh, communicate with uh, some sort of a TCP connection and things like that. Uh, the third one is people also uh, end up writing their own service discovery. So. Uh, this is in fact, I've seen in uh, like uh, people write microservices for service discovery. So don't do that. Uh, there are uh, the tools and technologies are uh, very much advanced. Uh, when we talk about service discovery, you can uh, uh, go ahead and use those tools directly. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, forcing microservices where it's not required. So just don't go with the uh, talks uh, that uh, all the big companies are using microservices. That, that That's the only reason if you have to use microservices. Uh, the next point is logging and monitoring as an afterthought. Uh, I've already discussed this. Uh, people generally take this as an afterthought and they end up uh, uh, facing a lot of troubles when you have to identify uh, uh, issues and you have to, uh, let's say, uh, see what are the uh, monitoring statistics and metrics and things like that. Uh, one technology and framework everywhere, uh, they end up choosing uh, one language and one framework, one particular framework for writing all the services. So don't do that. I think there are, uh, you can choose a uh, language that's, uh, that is best suitable for uh, writing your that particular microservices. So I've seen people, especially, especially in Java, they uh, use Spring for writing all the HTTP service, <laughs> uh, for all the HTTP services. So don't do that. Uh, there are micro frameworks available even in Java as well. So we do have a lot in Python. So uh, especially in case of Java, I've seen people use a uh, lot of bulky frameworks and they say that uh, it's microservices. So the next is uh, trade-off of using microservices. So these are some of the trade-offs. Uh, that I have identified. Uh, there are operations and tools cost uh, uh, that is involved. So you may end up uh, 
dealing with a lot of tools at the very initial phase of your project. So there are a lot of cost involved in this. The second one is cultural cost. You might be, uh, your team or your organization might not adapt microservices very uh, smoothly. So you have to uh, maybe convince them. Uh, so there is a lot of cultural cost involved in that because uh, generally what happens in an organization is there is one team for the entire product, but here we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be having different team for different, different services. So there's a sort of a cultural shift uh, uh, in that part. S distributed system complexity, yeah, so it's microservices is all about distributed system. So it has all the complexity uh, with like what we have it in distributed systems. Interfaces should be well defined, so the documentation is must. So let's say if I am working on a, uh, let's say if we are working on an e-commerce website and I am dealing with a, a payment service, so I should know, uh, I should tell uh, what parameters am I expecting and uh, things like that very clearly to the other teams so that you know they can uh, communicate it uh, uh, accordingly and uh, the transaction becomes much smooth. Uh, the next point is microservices is DevOps first architectural style. So yes, uh, as it is, as one of the characteristic of microservices is it has to be independently deployable. So I think uh, yeah, DevOps uh, thought process is required from uh, uh, the, I think uh, the very first day uh, when we uh, start approaching uh, our architecture in microservices way. And the other thing is, uh, team communication overhead is there. Uh, so you have, you might be communicating a lot uh, across the team about how uh, are you going to communicate and things like that. So that's why I said uh, the documentation is must uh, so that you can do all your communication effectively and things like that. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Avicek, for this interesting talk. Are there questions? Hi. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, can you please elaborate a little bit more on the shared database issue? Like, when is a problem, even if there is replication between database, could still be a problem that? Yes. So, uh, uh, what people do is, uh, let's say if, uh, two services wants to share a particular database. So uh, what they do is they directly uh, 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 fire an uh, query to the database and get the results. So I think that is not effective when we think about scalability because database uh, uh, might uh, end up uh, becoming the root cause when we think of scalability because we'll be keep on uh, scaling our microservices instances, but the database will remain one. So in that perspective, it's good not to uh, make database call directly. Uh, use the APIs so that uh, you are uh, smooth uh, uh, when, it, uh, when we talk about scalability and things like that. So that is what. But uh, just, uh, so in case uh, you say uh, use API, like the API of a microservice connected to database at the end. Yes, 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 yes. So is not more or less the same? Uh, so uh, with API, you can uh, have a load balancer in front of it and uh, uh, it can redirect to uh, whatever service instances it can. Uh, and then you can scale the database uh, independently. But uh, in case of shared database, you might uh, not be able to do that very smoothly. So that is the point. Okay, thanks. More, more questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, are your slides available online? There are a few that were quite detailed and I wanted to uh, pick them up later. Uh, sorry, I didn't get... Uh, uh, are your sli slides available online? So I'll put, uh, I'll put it on, on my GitHub, uh, maybe, yeah, so that you can look right into it. I see no more questions, so let's uh, thank Avishek again for his talk.